May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. You are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of these things, Jesus says to those whom he appears to. It is the evening of the day that he rose from the dead. In Luke's account of the resurrection, it is Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, and other women with them who discover the empty tomb. They arrive with spices and fragrant oils. They discover the stone rolled away. They encounter God's messengers robed in shining garments. He is not here, but is risen. When they report what they had seen, only Peter believes. He runs to the tomb and sees for himself. Peter marvels when he sees Jesus' burial linens lying by themselves. That afternoon, walking on the road to Emmaus, are two disciples. Jesus joins them, though their eyes are restrained from recognizing him. What are you talking about? The two cannot believe that there is someone who has not heard about the recent days. They tell him everything that has happened. Then Jesus tells them everything about himself. He tells how the Christ suffered and entered into glory. He did this beginning with Moses and the prophets, confirming that the Christ is fulfillment. The Christ is the fulfillment of everything before, not the replacement. The fulfillment of all that led up to the time. The fulfillment of all that has led up to our time. Christ is the who or whom of the resurrection. As they near their destination on the road to Emmaus, evening is approaching. He seems to be heading somewhere else. The two disciples invite him, stay with us, stay. The Greek word is meno. Abide is a better translation of meno. Stay, abide with us. Abide invites indwelling. Abide is not superficial. Abide connotes intimacy. Abide invites residency within. Be with us. Live in us. Walk with us. Direct our steps. Remain steadfast with us in all things. Abide says something about God's nature and the truest of our human nature. We are meant for God's indwelling. God means to be with, for, and in us. Abide, meno, does not just appear in this reading from Luke's gospel. From the words of the psalmist, we hear other versions of the word abide, O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. And in Sirach, she made among human beings an eternal foundation and among their descendants, she will abide faithfully. From the prophet Haggai, may spirit abide among you, do not be afraid. And in John's gospel, this is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees nor knows. You know because the spirit of truth abides with you. The spirit of truth will be in you. From Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and now faith, hope, and love abide. These three and the greatest of that which abides is love. Abide with us. Abide is the why of the resurrection narratives. 
It is the why of the resurrection narrative, so we may know that intimacy in relationship with God who abides in, with, and around us is possible. On this walk, the still unrecognized Jesus goes in and abides with the two companions at the table when they reach their destination. They invite him to abide. But it is when he takes bread, blesses, breaks, and gives it to them that their eyes are opened and they now know him in his abiding. It is when they recognize him that he vanishes from sight, but he is still present in them. They marvel. Did not our hearts burn as he talked and walked beside us while he opened the scriptures to us? The two cannot withhold what has happened. They get up immediately and return to Jerusalem and they join their companions there, confirming the spreading news that the Lord is risen indeed. As this happens, Jesus appears in their midst, shalom. Shalom, it's the traditional greeting of the day, peace be with you. We say, hi. We might even say, hey, they all can mean shalom. Shalom carries a meaning of permanence, like the invitation of abiding within. Shalom carries that meaning of permanence this way. May your wholeness be permanent. Hey, may you be sound in body, mind, and spirit. Hey, <laughs> may you be a carrier of God's peace. Shalom is the how of the resurrection. A way of God's permanent shalom, God's abiding within that indwelling is peace, born of love that abides. Yet, understandably, I imagine those gathered, those followers, they are startled, surprised, I don't know, terrified, frightening, mistaking what they are seeing for a ghost. But ghosts don't have flesh and bones, Luke tells us. Look, touch, see, it's really me. Now there's a mix of wonder and joy, puzzlement, sure, surprise, still a little fear, all right, what do you have to eat? He asks. They share a piece of baked fish, which he eats. Ghosts don't eat food. As Jesus did with the two on the road to Emmaus, he now shares with all of them everything written about him from Moses through the prophets, the psalmists. He opens their minds to understanding. They receive his abiding presence. They receive and share God's shalom. The newness of all this changes their lives forever and the unfolding of human civilization. Their trajectory is changed forever because they are witnesses of these things. We are invited to do and be the same. Luke ends his gospel narrative a few sentences later. Jesus leads them all to Bethany. He offers a blessing and is taken out of sight. They worship him and are overwhelmed with joy. Luke reminds us that they continuously praise God in the temple as faithful practicing Jews. We don't know many exact details about Luke, the Jew, who has written all of this. We know he was a physician. He was likely a companion with Paul on many missionary journeys as the Jesus movement continued to spread under dire circumstances. Luke continues to tell what happens next. The Acts of the Apostles is part two of his writing just as Jesus shared about the fulfillment of ancient teachings, Luke, the Gospel, Part 1, 
Jesus' followers now do likewise. Luke, the Acts of the Apostles, part two, that is unfolding to this very day. The Acts of the Apostles picks up the story where Luke's gospel leaves off. You may have noticed that throughout the entire Easter festival, the first reading gets replaced from the Old Covenant to the emergent movement of Jesus' way with the readings that we will have each Sunday until Pentecost from the Acts of the Apostles. We first hear in the Acts of the Apostles how the Jesus community, still part of the Jewish tradition, worships in the temple. That's how the gospel ends. Acts of the Apostles picks up from there in what happens next. They sell their material possessions and hold all things in a commonwealth. That was last week's reading from the Acts of the Apostles. What happens because they do that is the needs of all were met as a result. Every man, woman, and child, rich and poor alike, everybody. Jesus' movement levels the playing field of what anyone had experienced before. It still has that potential for us today. This sharing, this commonwealth of sharing, however, lasts a short time. Soon the authorities are onto them again, and their lives become much, danger, much more dangerous. They end up dispersing from Jerusalem, living as exiles because of the fear and persecution that they encounter. This still happens in this world today. The message Peter in, is in the midst of telling. We heard part of his speech in a previous week. We're hearing more of it today from the Acts of the Apostles is that the work of those who follow Jesus is to continue the movement. Peter, after all, is one of the eyewitnesses. He was there that first night among them. He saw Jesus eating that piece of broiled fish. He testifies to what he has seen. He shares the fulfillment of the tradition, the prophets, etc., etc. Peter tells how God levels the playing field through Christ for all by rising and restoring God's promise of new life to creation, which is the Easter message of reconciliation and love. Even today, we get to decide if we will accept God's abiding with us through Christ's nature, whether we will live out and share God's shalom as part of the people that enjoy God's abiding. God's call is to religious and non-religious alike, abiding and shalom. There are no boundaries unless we misuse God's abiding unless we misuse and abuse God's shalom again. You do not need to hear from me this morning in all the ways all the powers are working in this world today for us to know the impact of God's abiding and God's shalom and its potential for changing the trajectory of our world and God's creation. I hope we have the eyes to see and believe the examples of the sincerity and truth of God's abiding and shalom. We can still be witnesses to these things. I will be a witness, will you? What a great precursor for this afternoon which is about the renewal of ministry in this place among all of us, young and old, male and female, laity ordained, because Jesus has leveled the playing field. And we are called to work in that leveled playing field. My prayer for us today and for the days, months, and weeks to come is that we will trust God's will to do and be the witnesses that we are called to be 
and that we will enjoy God's wisdom and grace and God's abiding. The only way this is going to work is to acknowledge God's abiding and God's shalom. Anything else will return us to God's abiding and God's shalom. That's our work today. Amen. Morning prayer is an opportunity to preach much longer. And what a great opportunity to um, pick up on all of the threads of Easter that um, our other liturgies don't always allow us to do so quickly. I've just saved us three years of Easter preaching, and now we're all up to date. What a great opportunity. Still, I love the Eucharist, as you do.